On November 24, 1963, Jack Ruby became a household name and has been ever since. It is highly probable that very few, if any, would remember him today but for the single moment in time seen on live TV in which he shot and killed alleged presidential assassin Lee Harvey Oswald. Why he killed Oswald remains a mystery. Explanations range from a grieving soul who wanted to spare Jacqueline Kennedy the torches of a trial to conspiracy theories involving the mob, the CIA, or agents of the Cuban government. But just who was Jack Ruby? His real name was Jacob Leon Rubenstein, and he was born in Chicago sometime in 1911, the exact date of his birth being somewhat of a mystery. The date he most often gave was March 25th. Ruby was the fifth of ten surviving children. His parents had immigrated from Poland to escape not only poverty, but the growing anti-Semitism in Europe during the latter half of the 19th century. Raised in an Orthodox Jewish home, he grew up in the Maxwell Street area of Chicago. His sister Eva characterized it as below the middle class, but yet it wasn't the poorest class. Ruby's parents generally lived near Italian sections where there were frequent fights along ethnic lines. At an early age, Jack broke with the straight-laced beliefs of his parents becoming what family friends referred to as a problem child, racking up arrests for juvenile delinquency and truancy, with his first arrest coming at the tender age of 11. According to his sister, Ava Grant, Jack got a nickname that he really didn't like, Sparky, and anyone who was foolish enough to say it to his face would then be introduced to Jack's fist. He dropped out of high school during his 8th grade year and never looked back. Due to his proclivity for breaking the law, Jack spent court-ordered time in foster care as well as time with the Institute of Juvenile Research. He picked up quick cash on the street selling tip sheets at the racetrack as well as committing other petty crimes. Later he became an agent for the Garbage Collectors Union, which eventually merged with the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Ed Becker, in his book All-American Mafioso, the Johnny Roselli story noted, Ruby came of age running with a street gang that used to run innocuous errands for Al Capone. He graduated to become a top union slugger under Paul Dorfman and was arrested and questioned by police in connection with the 1939 murder of Leon Cook, founder of Local 2467 of the Scrap Iron and Junk Handlers Union. But without any evidence to hold him, Ruby was ultimately released. He left the police station that day smiling because he had dodged a possible conviction and his star was on the rise with the Chicago outfit. After the death of Cook, Dorfman assumed control of the Union and Jack Ruby was slated as his right-hand man. Later, the AFL-CIO stated that the Union was largely a shakedown operation and that Dorfman and Ruby had their hands deep in the till. On December 7, 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and the whole world was thrown into war. Jack never volunteered to join the military, but was finally drafted in 1943 and served in the Army Air Corps, working as an aircraft mechanic until he was discharged in 1946. He never saw combat, but was praised by his superiors for serving honorably. He was discharged on February 21st and returned to Chicago. For reasons never quite clear even to Ruby, things had changed during his three-year absence. The Windy City had all but forgotten the name Jack Ruby. According to Ed Becker, Ruby fell out of favor. He later told a friend he had been exiled from Chicago by the mob and was directed to move to Dallas. Upon arriving in the Lone Star State, Ruby opened a string of sleazy nightclubs, living the life of an exiled Chicago gangster. During this time, he became involved in gambling, prostitution, and drug trafficking. In 1952, Ruby and two other associates purchased the Bob Willis Ranch House and renamed it the Vegas Club. Seven years later, Ruby and another associate purchased a private club in the heart of downtown Dallas. They renovated it and a year later renamed it the Carousel Club, 
featuring Vegas-style striptease shows. Ruby was arrested nine times during his 16 years as a citizen of Dallas, but ironically, he never faced trial. Ruby was smart. He had cemented strong ties with local law enforcement in the Dallas Police Department and the Sheriff's Office. Free drinks and his prize girls were on the menu for the men in blue. It was also rumored that Ruby was in tight with the DA's office, who were also shown a good time whenever they dropped by. It was an explosive time in world history. The mob was in its heyday, with its criminal activities far-reaching. Chicago boss Sam Giancana, New Orleans boss Carlos Marcello, and Florida boss Santo Traficante had invested heavily in Cuba, purchasing and opening numerous casinos, nightclubs, and brothels. But revolution was in the air in Cuba. In typical mob fashion, and to hedge their bets on the next Cuban government, the mob decided to play both sides of the fence, openly supporting the Batista regime, but covertly working with Fidel Castro. As a result, the mob began running guns to Castro, and Ruby was called on to be one of their liaisons. By 1959, Batista was out, and Castro was in. He later revealed his true colors by declaring himself a communist and throwing the gangsters out of Cuba. The mob lost millions and Santo Traficante was jailed. To say the mob was angry and felt betrayed would be an understatement. And it is at this point where things get really confusing and kind of weird. The mob had what they thought was an ace in the hole. Gus Russo documents in his book, The Chicago Outfit, that the mob not only helped John Kennedy get elected, but may have even fixed the outcome. Surely, they reasoned, Kennedy owed them something. So the mob, along with the CIA, began working together to take Castro out, and the president was fully aware and supported their involvement, a fact never revealed to the Warren Commission. But as the old adage goes, there are no secrets that time does not reveal. In fact, during the 1978 House Select Committee on Assassinations, CIA officials and mobster Johnny Roselli both admitted they were working together to assassinate Fidel Castro and that they got help from Giancana and Traficante. But instead of their government being grateful, the Kennedys, especially Bobby, turned on their former partners. The failed Bay of Pigs invasion, coupled with the increasing pressure by the Attorney General's investigation on the mob's activities, left them feeling doubly betrayed. So who actually killed President Kennedy? Was it a lone nut, namely Lee Harvey Oswald, which was the conclusion reached by the Warren Commission? Was it a coup d'etat by rogue government agencies? Was it Cuban agents, or was it the mob? Theories abound and it is doubtful that we will ever know for sure. But numerous reports state that when Santo Traficani was jailed in Cuba, he was slated for execution, and that Jack Ruby was sent to Cuba in 1959 to negotiate for his release. If this is accurate, it would make sense due to the fact that Ruby was the point man for the gun-running operation to the Castro Revolutionary Forces. Whatever the truth, Traficante was ultimately released. During the Warren Commission investigation, evidence of a Ruby Oswald connection was downplayed. And though the data is still somewhat obscure, researchers over the years have confirmed numerous links between the two before the killing of the president. What we do know is from 1960 to 1963, Ruby ran his nightclubs, spending most of his time at the carousel. By most accounts, if he did have mob connections, he was considered less than a flunky. On November 22, 1963, John F. Kennedy made a stop in Dallas to deliver a speech at the International Trade Mart. As the presidential motorcade made its way down Main Street, they turned right on Houston and then left on Elm. Shots rang out and President Kennedy was pronounced dead at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. A suspect, Lee Harvey Oswald, was captured within hours. For reasons unknown, Jack Ruby shadowed Oswald, making a number of trips to the Dallas police station over the next few days, and the rest is history. On Sunday morning, November 24, 1963, 
Just two days after the assassination of President Kennedy, Ruby, standing with a group of reporters in the basement of the Dallas Police Department, lunged forward with a 38 revolver in hand and fired a single shot, killing suspected assassin Lee Harvey Oswald. As stated earlier, why he did it has never been very clear. However, the Warren Commission concluded that there was no mob connection. But historians and journalists who have studied the case of Jack Ruby have found that between 1962 and 63, Ruby made phone calls to no less than seven organized crime figures who had been prosecuted by Attorney General Bobby Kennedy's Justice Department. Ruby's roots were with the Chicago outfit, who had close ties with both Marcello in New Orleans and Traficante in Florida. In 1979, the House Select Committee on Assassinations concluded that Hoffa, Marcello, and Traficante all had the motive, means, and opportunity to assassinate Kennedy. During the same hearings, an FBI informant testified that Traficante had stated that Kennedy was going to be hit as a result of then-Attorney General Robert Kennedy going after the mob's cash cow, Jimmy Hoffa. In 1992, Frank Regano, a longtime lawyer for Hoffa and Traficante, told the New York Post that the two mobsters and Marcello had agreed to kill the president. Regano claimed that Traficante said on his deathbed, Carlos f***ed up. We shouldn't have gotten rid of Giovanni, meaning John. We should have killed Bobby. During the Warren investigation, Ruby told commissioners that he was not free to talk in Dallas, fearing for his life. He asked to go back to Washington with them and that he would then reveal all that he knows. His request was denied and therefore he never gave a statement. On March 14, 1964, Jack Ruby was found guilty of murder with malice of Lee Harvey Oswald and sentenced to die in the electric chair. It was the first courtroom verdict to be televised in U.S. history. In October 1966, the Texas Court of Appeals reversed the decision on the grounds of improper admission of testimony and the fact that Ruby could not have received a fair trial in Dallas at the time. On January 3, 1967, while awaiting a new trial to be held in Wichita Falls, Ruby died at Parkland Hospital of a pulmonary embolism brought on by advanced lung cancer. He was buried beside his parents in the Westlawn Cemetery in Norridge, Illinois.